Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, my talk won't be as long as and complicated as some of the previous ones. Um, but uh, there is legislation in the, in the EU that uh, may well affect aerospace throughout the world. So it's uh, not only coming out from Europe, but if you're trying to sell into Europe, then they'll have the same constraints. Um, the title of the conference is Challenges in Design and Deployment. And what we have done here, um, it's interesting in the previous session, the gentleman from Russia was talking about collaborative R&D within the EU, within a thing called FP7, um, which is Framework 7. Uh, something that I'm very familiar with. We've already been involved with Framework 6 and Framework 7 projects ourselves, and some of our coatings have been evaluated in these international EU programs, which often collaborate uh, as many as eight or ten countries. I was a little surprised, I have to say, that Russia was involved in that. I hadn't heard that one, so it was quite useful for me. Um, I'll also comment that... Um, it's not uh, high temperature erosion resistant coatings, which is something else that we do um, when we're coating gas turbine engines and so forth, which is a, another subject. So the objectives of the talk today will be to cover several points. Uh, so one of the things we'll be talking about is what we are and what we have available, why we're here. Um, we'll also be talking about REACH, which if you haven't heard of it, um, be prepared to hear of it. It's EU leg legislation, and if you make anything that is being sold into to, to Europe, you will have to take notice of it. Likewise, in Europe, Everything that we're dealing with uh, in terms of chemicals are uh, under review. Um, the purpose of the legislation is to try and make workforce safer, and it's again uh, the environment. Um, and in terms of aircraft, if uh, any of you are dealing with aircraft, then chromate, if you're uh, using building aircraft, is used in many phases of it. And at the moment, under REACH, it is certainly under discussion and perhaps under threat. Um, it stands for Registration, Evaluation, Authorization and Restriction of Chemicals. When they first envisaged the list in 2001, they thought there were 30,000 chemicals in Europe. At the latest count, they've had 220,000 chemicals. The idea is to list them all and to remove what they consider to be the dangerous ones. Chromates and so forth, which are often used in um, metal work for aircraft and other parts, are used on uh, such an areas as aluminium, where chromic acid anodizing, chromate primers, chromate washes, allochrome, are all well known to you and currently under serious risk. I'll touch upon that a little later. And then finally, we, in, we make coatings for aerospace and defence. And often, many of the coatings we have may have four, five, six generations, a bit like aircraft bodies. And what happens is, is that we have a generation where we start off, and as, as we get more and more understanding and more and more w uh, work done with different bodies, and perhaps the environment. Environment's a perfect example where 10 years ago, in paints and coatings for aircraft, everybody used lots of solvent and toluene and xylene, which is a product now that in Europe is certainly being frowned on and will probably be legislated out also under reach. We'll touch upon erosion-resistant polymeric coatings um, which are various types, polyurethane, elastomeric, and conductive anti-static anti coatings, and we're also doing work on anti-icing as well. So what do we do? Basically, our company is a, a small company. Well, we do 
in-house research and development. Oh, sorry, pick that one. Um, we research the project. We come out to see customers. So, for example, you'll see an example a bit later on of work that we've done with the uh, light, uh, the, uh, uh, light attack helicopter. We basically invent coatings, get it accepted by the end user. We go into product manufacturing and make batches of the coatings. And then we deliver it to such areas as, as yourselves where often you may need support in learning how to apply the, the material correctly so they can use the material here. It's no good us throwing you tins of material and not knowing how to use it. And then we stop the material and we dispatch it worldwide. And you'll see a little bit there. And some of our... Uh, we're obviously in the UK. Uh, and we have stocking facilities in America, France, Spain, although it's not highlighted there, um, in the Saudi area, India. And that was supposed to be Singapore, but we weren't very good at geography. <laughs> so you excuse us with that. But effectively, those where we're stocking, and at the moment we export to 50 countries. Basically, when you make an aircraft, and it lands in another country, and we're not just dealing with civil air, uh, military aircraft here, we deal with military, civil aircraft as well. And you can't land a country in Australia and expect to go down to the local shop and buy the product to maintain it. So although you have an indigenous material source here, our materials fly all over the world on Rolls-Royce jet engines, Messier Doughty undercarriages, Doughty aerospace propellers. They're use, all using our coatings, for example. Next we'll see some of the customers that use our coatings and they're just a, a selection of people who approve our products. That's a, this is a list which is not comprehensive but it gives you an idea of those people who currently use our coatings and hopefully will be one of the reasons why you uh, at least consider us for uh, other projects. Basically, just to put it in context, um, materials for aerospace are a relatively small volume in terms of paint and coatings. So the development and technology, they have much larger companies than us dealing with airframe paints, and you're probably aware of those as well. Um, but some of the smaller volume things for example, baking epoxies for engineering components, there are uh, such things as, and I've actually been speaking to a gentleman this afternoon as you've been using them, uh, magnesium gearboxes, um, primers, and I, I mentioned here anti-corrosive primers, that's actually the chromate that I will be discussing in a, in a minute that's under threat and from reach. Um, we'll be talking, well, you'll see an example of cold cure polyurethane on your helicopters, uh, low friction coatings for such diverse areas as uh, assembly of nuts and bolts, but also in areas such as uh, fretting wear on uh, uh, gas turbine blade roots. Intumescence and thermal barrier systems where you need a one-time coating for fire. So typically uh, an intumescent might be put on a fuel pump and it's been used for, tested for five minutes for fire, FAA fire resistant. 15 minutes for fireproof. And a, a fuel pump typically might last two and a half minutes without an intumescent coating on. With an intumescent coating, it passes. And you don't have to bother with a firewall, for example. A uh, similar system for passenger aircraft in Boeing and Airbus. Um, you know, obviously, they try and reduce the threat of burning. So the idea is not to have uh, anything that, that will burn very easily. So they have specially formulated non-burn systems for all of the, the, the uh, articles inside aircraft. That includes seat backs, even the inside of the interior where you're painting as well. Um, something we'll touch on, uh, in fact, is primers and finishes for composites um, and to do with uh, radomes, for example. And 
I've mentioned this already, uh, a product for uh, gas turbines, but now being used as a cadmium replacement on uh, marraging steels in undercarriages. And the subject we'll be talking about, erosion and abrasion resistant coatings, um, and we also do uh, products for uh, various engineering companies in the UK, which are production aids. All of our coatings we make in Europe. We have to deal with customers worldwide. So when we make our products, our products have to be available for use in different countries and the environment is becoming much more dominant. We've talked today about noise pollution. We've talked to today about fuel efficiency. Well, it's the same problem in actually manufacturing aircraft. And when you're making an aircraft and using composites, there's a lot of um, solvents and chemicals used which need, well, in the EU's mind, to be looked at in terms of legislation. This legislation came, was actually invoked in 2001, and it came into action in the EU in 2011. And it basically stands for registration. So the chemicals over 1,000 tonnes have to be registered by 2011, over 100 tonnes by 2014, and under, and under 10 tonnes by 2018. Now, whether you like it or not, in Europe, that is actually 230,000 chemicals, which is a big project. But there are about a thousand products already on the at risk register. And what they mean by that is, is that the EU has considered them and thinks they're dangerous to humankind. If I give you an analogy that you'll all relate to, think in the past where people happily used asbestos, lead, and sort of cadmium. And these products in the thousand that I'm talking about can really sort of be considered in that same light. Now the idea is, is they register the material. If it's not registered, they will not be allowed to be used in Europe. Even if they are registered, what they then do is evaluate them and the at-risk products, the high, highest priority products are under consideration. Uh, how does this have relevance to you in India? Well, a lot of your chemicals come from European developments. Likewise, you all have clients in Europe. If, for example, if you send something with chromates on after 2016-17, you may well not get it into Europe because they will require it to be authorised. Authorisation. We are currently in the first authorisation tranche, and this is new le legislation. We are a member, one member of 150 companies, including Rolls-Royce, Fokker, Airbus, Safran Group, all in the first tranche, just trying to get chromic acid authorised. Chromic acid alone is the first product, and it's under an organisation called CTAC. Um, that budget for a solicitor just to defend that product is four and a half million pounds at the moment for one chemical. So it's fairly uh, onerous stuff. Now, so basically, and in a, in a, if you are ever, any of you use N-methylprolidone and other solvents, which are often used in paint strippers, um, they are going, they're already going to be lost in Europe in 2016. So you can use it for now, but in theory, after 2016, it will become illegal and you won't get that type of product made in Europe because it hasn't been registered and it won't come out of Europe and you won't be able to ship it back into Europe. So it gives you an idea of the traconial nature of these sorts of things. And when you're inventing paints and coatings in Europe and other things, you have to take control of, of other legislation. So the Solvents Directive is, uh, is basically some years ago you would have a paint it contained 70% so, uh, solvent now it has to often contain 30% solvent and many are going down to water based 
And the water-based technology is only 8 to 10 years old. It often isn't as good as solvent-based, which has been going for 100 years. Um, hazardous air pollutants are also considered in that, in manufacturing and in the emissions when you're making. And one of the cases that we'll come across where we're, we may, in the, had to uh, develop a coating for a propeller maker, the local authority stated that they had to reduce the emission that they made to air. Pollution will become an, in, an issue in India. Your plants are issue, uh, issuing solvents and nasties to the air. Eventually, your population will probably object to it. That is under control. Well, under theoretical control in Europe and is causing draconian legislation for um, control of, of use of substances and emissions to air and water. Um, on this subject, I'll just go back a second. Um, one of the things that we talked about um, is chrome and we have just finished signing a contract within the UK for research and development led by Rolls-Royce, including BAE, Augusta Westland, Messier Doughty, um, GE Smiths, and some other, Megit, all looking at simply replacing chromate primer on aluminium. That's a three million pound R&D project that we're only just starting and it's one of many. Airbus has 12 programs to get rid of chromate on its airframes. So I now move on a little to uh, elastomeric coatings and effectively you'll see some materials here where we've dealt with composite airframe vehicles and when you paint composites it isn't always the same as when you paint metal. You need, for a start off, you don't need chromate primer. So if you've got a composite aircraft, you're already well in advance of the EU legislation because if you have an aluminium aircraft at the moment, to my knowledge, both Boeing and Airbus don't really have a satisfactory answer to chrome free. So composite airframe vehicles don't need chromate, um, a big bonus. We'll also lo lo loosely touch upon development of coating for propeller blades and also on, on radomes. Um, in the last few years, we've been working with one of your local uh, agents, um, Matcon, where we were looking at coating the latest attack helicopter. Um, it's a fully composite airframe with composite rotor blades and resin-rich materials. Beg your pardon, too fast. Um, we put forward a system here where we had low VOC, so I've mentioned that already, where we've taken 70% paint, the solvent containing paint, we now have 30% solvent containing paint. It also doesn't have nasties of toluene uh, in there, which already is pretty nearly banned in the US. Um, there's a low VOC two-pack lightweight epoxy filler. Helicopters are very critical on weight. All aircraft are. Um, but particularly helicopters. And so we had to develop um, a low VOC, a, a lightweight filler that was used on that material, and a putty for localised use, and finally top coats. And you can see here it in actual being coated in your, one of your facilities in HAL. And here's some of the coating being put forward um, primer surface on the majority of the airframe. And then eventually we put on the camouflage colours, which you can start to see here. And effectively, and Gopal told me very good, well here that this is the uh, digital camouflage pattern, which are, seems alien to me because our camouflage patterns are different to those. But these are some of the units that have been painted using our systems. We're now going to go touch upon three areas with some commonality and these are actual examples of, of work that we've done with the uh, various aero, aero part 
manufacturers, but we can't name them for obvious purposes, but their evol evolution of coatings that have solved problems for them. And in fact, elastomeric PUs are often used in abrasion-resistant coatings. Um, they have erosion resistance, they're flexible, exterior durability. Typically on aircraft, I mean typically um, it's minus 50 to plus 100 degrees C is the temperature range for these sorts of coatings, unlike the other erosion coatings which we do, which go up to uh, 600, 700 degrees C and higher in fact. Um, there can be some drawbacks of some of the coatings. Ease of application. Um, one of the products we replaced on radar, or we're replacing on radomes, is a, an American import. And in, our, in the instance in the UK, it takes up to a week to apply the coating. Um, we replaced it with new coatings, which are currently being finalised and take considerably less time. Uh, system adhesion. Um, adhesion to composite can be difficult. You can't paint it. Sounds very simple to some people, but you can get problems of dissimilarity and shelling off if you don't do it incorrectly. Um, and the ones that we're specifically going to be talking about today are engine nose spinners, where there was a particular problem, um, propeller blades, which I'll refer to in a little while, and radome coatings. Engine nose cone spinner, you see a typical one here, was actually used on a range of jet engines and it's a system that's been used for some years or many years and it was found to be de degra degrading in UV light. Now, I've just been outside in your sunshine and believe me, you get a lot more UV than we do in the UK. So UV light, but when you're flying at 35,000 feet or so, UV is a major problem for coatings. So adhesion failures in service happened, which was fairly catastrophic. It actually um, came off and, I believe, went through an engine. So uh, basically, we tried to work out with uh, the uh, end users whether it was a problem of base coat application or UV degradation or other coatings. And we investigated various types of uh, base coats and how we could use user friend, more user-friendly component, two component systems and also integration of further UV absorbers. And typically this was some work that we did with uh, the end users and we were looking at the, um, this, these materials with UV stabilised and part cured, full cured and you, effectively this was analysed with the, uh, the people and we had the various colours that were uh, appraised and a, a way of working the information out with them to optimise the systems as they went and predict why the existing coatings failed. Just um, minutes, okay. So basically in a very short time, um, the, we, we found that the new materials were solved the adhesion problems and to our surprise, a clear base coat was better than, than a black or an aluminium. Normally, the um, sunlight shines through it. And the new UV absorbers improved the material. And then move on to... Pre uh, there is a new, new R&D UK-funded uh, project going on looking at nano -seria. Nano is a very, another emotive subject that the EU is already trying to ban. There is discussion of that already, so we're trying to work that one out. Propeller coatings had a similar issue uh, that had variable adhesion, and this was actually a sim a, 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 not the same system, but they actually used a, an elastomeric PU top coat, and they basically were using the material but getting 20% rejection in production. This was their system that they combined a, a resin and a catalyst from dissimilar suppliers. We went in formulated it into the correct coating and now they're getting 100% delivery efficiency rather than 80% and also they were also gave a significant reduction in VOC emissions. I also mentioned very quickly radome 
coatings and a similar issue was here. Um, there is a discussion here where radon coatings for airborne need good long term resistance to natural weathering, adhesion to composites, a removal, possible removal of static buildup, radar transparency of the coating, whereas grade, ground radomes are different because they have much higher emission of radar property. They also have a, a, a possibility of a product, a, a thing called reversion, where it reverts to a, a, a fluid material. Effectively, the system that we did um, was uh, trialled and is been tested under the radar and is okay from that. It's replacing uh, an American import which was causing some problems with ITAR and also it takes a week to coat the material. Um, we also had erosion testing by, done by the Swedish Rhone Erosion Test Rig and on the right was the American import and on the left was our material. So they were pretty happy with that. We also are now recently doing uh, nano research into electrically conductive coating for anti-static purposes. On a propeller you also have, have um, anti-static requirements which is currently done by heavy loading of graphite. Um, we've just got proof of concept material where you where you optimizing carbon nanotubes in materials. Uh, lightweight, much easier to apply, and much more like a paint. So, in short, I've told you a little bit about ourselves and our customer base. We've highlighted REACH, another legislation. So, if you're dealing with EU suppliers, they have people on their shoulders called governments, and they are having to look at environmental legislation very heavily. We've looked at use, quickly use of erosion-resistant polymeric coatings on various materials, Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brain Norton. It was a very good exposure to the new generation of uh, paints from various uh, objectives. I'm very sure it's a good education to the engineers who are working in the current projects. I'm sure uh, they will definitely get benefited by the exposure and the knowledge of availability of uh, new generation paints for various applications. Uh, are there any questions, please? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, I just want to know your uh, how compatible uh, these coatings are against the corrosion resistant. How compatible these are with corrosion resistant coating? Um, on radomes and propellers, generally there isn't um, an issue because they're generally composites. So uh, they, but, but you can have them. F I had to check on that because, for example, radome, co uh, sorry, radome coatings. I don't know whether you've got. I haven't looked at it recently, but I'm not sure whether you can put chromate primer as a primer down on that because it's a, a pigment that may give you a problem. But in terms of um, erosion resistance in other areas, so for example leading edges of supersonic jet wings uh, yes they have capabilities with that, but it's a different system you use, I, I com concentrated on composites in this instance so you use a different primer with uh, similar coating systems for erosion yeah. Just one more question Yeah, uh, I am Rajendran from GTRE you have talked about uh, dry film coating which will do anti fretting job is it for the engine application you are talking about? I'm sorry, you said dry film lubricants, what? Uh, dry film lubricant for anti-fretting anti -fretting coating. Uh, is it for the engine application? Uh, yes, it is, yes. Uh, uh. Typic typically on, well in this instance, Rolls-Royce, but also used by Pratt & Whitney and ser several other uh, end users. Uh, see, anti-fretting coating in engine we use for the dovetail part of the compressor and fan blades. It's used on the dovetail, yes. Uh, yeah, and, yes. and we use a metallic composition, copper nickel indium. Yeah, and I'm well familiar with copper nickel indium. Uh, what is, you are talking about polymeric paint coating. What is the coating you are using there? Um, often they use copper nickel indium and overcoat it with one of our coatings. Oh, you talk about the same coating? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you.